How's it going guys? I hope the audio is all good. Um, we have been struggling with that. Let me know in the comments if there are any issues. Um, so, Series B. Uh, <clears throat> this is one of the most interesting, um, I guess, components. Oh, nice. Okay, good. Sweet. All right, guys. Looks like this is going to be the first live stream I've done in a while where we didn't start out with echoing audio or some other embarrassing nonsense going on. Um, right on guys. Okay. So Sirius B, um, you know, you can look all over the planet from Egypt to, uh, you know, ayahuasca dr drinking tribes like the Sequoia in South America, the Hopi, uh, in Masonic lodges, uh, you know, throughout the Western occult, uh, tradition, my own experiences, um, relating to Sirius B are absolutely you know, it's not just that they're mind blowing, but it's the way that they assert themselves with so much evidence. Um, and, and we'll get to that. But, you know, a lot of these experiences that I had, particularly regarding um, Sirius B or with connections to Sirius B, happen with a bunch of witnesses. So, you know, there's there's no possibility that these are the ravings of a disordered mind. There are absolutely things that happened. Um, you know, uh, one thing that I would recommend uh, along these lines um, is Cosmic Trigger by Robert Anton Wilson, who is absolutely one of my heroes and I think one of the great intellects um, of, I guess it was the 20th century. Uh, the Illuminatus Trilogy, I feel like, is the greatest book ever written. Um, and a lot of it, by the way, was uh, they, they would take acid and they would chop the book up and put it in a hat and then pull the pieces out and assemble it. Um, while high on LSD and the results are phenomenal um, Anyways, I don't want to go too far down that rabbit hole But he eventually said that he had gone insane and that it wasn't real But at the time that he was writing it he believed that he was in telepathic communication with an alien from Sirius B And you know, I have to say that that book does not read like the ravings of a disordered mind um, It does not strike me as something that a mentally ill person on any level could have created and so what prompted this uh, particular live stream um, were a, a few more recent events. Um, and, you know, things are very chaotic right now. We're in the middle of, of uh, retreats and there's a lot going on. So I haven't had a lot of time to really organize uh, my thoughts around this. I'm definitely improvising quite a bit tonight. I'll do my best to, to uh, offer some conceptual continuity here. Um, but I, I did a video, a reaction video to this Hopi prophecy that has to do with the Blue Star Kachina. And a sort of um, summary of the relationship with Sirius there, not only is the prophecy remarkably accurate, there are, um, you know, constituent elements of this uh, prophecy. I don't know where that screensaver came from, honestly, the background. Um, yeah, Cosmic Trigger. I'm sorry if I didn't mention the name. The Cosmic Trigger, uh, the first Cosmic Trigger book uh, is the one I was speaking about. Um, but the Blue Star Kachina, the Blue Star is Sirius B. And the Kachina is basically a spirit or an intelligence. Uh, and the appearance of this spirit or intelligence uh, is the like sort of like the final indicator that we have entered into this time of the third great shaking of the word world, which is, it seems, you know, really obvious that it's a third world war. And here we are uh, on the edge of a oh, third world war. Um, and a lot of the other aspects of um, the prophecy have, have come to pass. You know, there's actual, actual mention of, uh, a proliferation of transgendered people as one of the signs that we're entering this period. And, you know, uh, it's worthy of noting maybe that it's not a negative judgment. The Hopi are not saying that because there are transgendered people, great spirit is going to shake the earth. Nothing like that. It's just, you know, one of the indicators. Um, and so, you know, it's also worthy of noting, I think, that when we find a totally disparate aloha, um, totally separate, um, you know, culturally separated uh, prophetical writings. Um, it's one of the, the, the things that makes me raise my eyebrows, you know. 
Um, and it's worthy of noting in this context that in Aleister Crowley's introduction to the Book of the Law, he says that one of the major indicators that we're going to see that's going to let us know that we are entering into what he termed the new aeon and this being that he was supposedly channeling also said that the world would be soaked with blood. Um, he says that people will become more uh, bisexual and epicen. And epicen actually means that they will not have an obvious um, gender. And so, you know, I mean, there's just an awful lot of different um, stars, I guess, kind of aligning um, that really give a lot of weight, I think, to this whole, uh, you know, I guess we could put it under the umbrella term of the, of the Hopi's Blue Star Prophecy and the Blue Star Kachina. Um, I am going to get to my own personal experience in a moment regarding what I have come to realize may have actually been... A, a literal encounter with this blue star Kachina. And I didn't even realize this or start to think about it until we just hit 11, 11, 11 viewers and 11 likes. Um, as I mentioned this Kachina, so, uh, you know, coincidence, I guess, but, um, could also be symmetry. Um, but I want to give a little bit more background and just a couple more examples of, you know, where this shows up throughout um, time and space and what happened this week that led to uh, the decision to do this live stream um, and so I had just done this this live stream on the Blue Star Kachina and the Hopi Prophecy and I noticed that you know even though there was some um, contention I guess regarding the actual date of the prophecy right the Hopi claim that it's thousands and thousands of years old the speaker at this event uh, was saying that it was carbon dated to be at least 10,000 years old and possibly as old as 50 of these stone tablets um, But other people have claimed that there's no evidence that it existed before 1953 um, I would point out that that is pretty much irrelevant because uh, It sounds like the person writing is making observations from yesterday uh, And you know that's so whether it was 1953 or 10,000 years ago doesn't really you know invalidate anything um it's almost irrelevant so there's that so um i was i had i had posted the reaction video to the blue star kachina and someone from the sequoia tribe uh who is a ayahuasca drinking tribe here in south america mentioned that you know this sequoia we also believe that when we're drinking ayahuasca that we're receiving transmissions from the blue star and you know when i heard that i just my hairs are standing up all over my body because if any of you guys have seen my ayahuasca and the star tribes video i had that experience and this was many years um, before any sequoia person had ever told me um, that the sequoia also believe that they are receiving transmissions from uh, the blue star when they drink ayahuasca and it turns out that it's not just the sequoia um, the dogon tribe in africa have had a star chart that is accurate up to seven star systems away and they have known that there were three bodies and that the third was um well our our astrophysicists have known that or suspected that there was a third uh planet or star causing a wobble on sirius b Right, but the Dogon have known that since at least 1950, uh, and they had no telescopes. They had Carl Sagan actually uh, was convinced that they must have had contact with actual ETs in order to have this information. So, um, oh, and also the Dogon claim that they received cannabis as a gift from those extraterrestrials, and it's worthy of noting that cannabis actually is the most biologically advanced plant on Earth. And so if there is, just as the octopus uh, in the animal kingdom is the most um, viable candidate for having like extraterrestrial origins, uh, the cannabis plant definitely represents that, um, you know, candidate for the, uh, the, the plant kingdom. So um, I guess I should, uh, should I tell my story now? Um, yeah, I guess I will. Okay. So my experience with, um, ayahuasca and the star tribes, um, I am a guitar player and I played all the time, uh, up until the last couple of years. 
And so I used to live with a girl um, and we lived in a very small one bedroom cabin in the Redwood Forest in uh, Northern California. By the way, you guys, do me a favor, hit the like button, share these videos, subscribe. We are demonetized so the algorithm ignores me. When my channel grows, it's because of grassroots efforts. It's because people uh, suggest my videos to their friends or share them on Facebook or whatever it is. Um, Facebook has also notified me that my content is going to be buried in people's feeds. Um, so I have very little ability to promote myself. So I really appreciate it when you guys do it. There are also ways to support us um, via Patreon. And um, I think I put, uh, if I didn't, I will go do it now. Um, Zelle, PayPal, cryptocurrency, all Zelle, of those options. PayPal, uh, I'm going to throw it in the chat. Uh, we really do appreciate your support. I put an awful lot of time into this. Um, and our secret streams, I think, are very valuable. Uh, we've been going through the 28th degree of Freemasonry uh, using Albert Pike, the 33rd degree Freemasons uh, book, Morals and Dogma, as our guide. Um, and, you know, again, Series B is the blue star in the lodges. Um, and we'll get to the significance of that in a moment. So, yeah, I really do appreciate your support. Um, also, we are still doing retreats, uh, teaching hermetic ritual magic and plant medicine. So uh, you can shoot me an email if you're interested in that. In two weeks, we're, living, we're moving to what is literally the Quechua Stonehenge Ayahuasca. It is a tremendous honor that we're being allowed to go and actually invited myself to lead ceremonies at this place that's basically the Mecca um, for Ecuadorian Quechua. Um, that will start probably in December. Um, so anyways, uh, my experience um, with ayahuasca and the star tribes. <clears throat> and, you know, it's, it's still, it still blows my mind to even think about this story. But okay, so I played guitar a lot and I was living in a one room apartment. So my very tolerant girlfriend was in the same room with me all the time when I was practicing. And uh, one day she said, um, you know, there's this sort of like purple geisha demon looking thing that is like barely there, almost like an aura. But sometimes when you're really concentrating and practicing, um, I can see it hovering behind you. Um, and so, you know, she was kind of out there and I, I didn't, I'm not going to say I didn't think anything of it, but I was like, okay, cool. So Satan's my spirit animal or whatever, you know, that's awesome. Metal, totally metal. Um, so, uh, a few weeks later, I was practicing, uh, with a friend in, uh, Laytonville, California. And, uh, he said, man, I got to tell you something. A couple of times when we're, when we're playing, I can see this like purple geisha demon sort of thing kind of hovering behind you. And so at that point I was like, okay, well that's weird. Now we have two people that don't even know each other. There's no possibility that they're talking like no possibility at all. Um, and uh, about a week after that, um, I was playing a gig again in Laytonville. And as I was walking out, there was this kid, I feel terrible that I don't know his name, but he was Maori, he had the face tattoos, the whole, the whole nine yards. Um, <laughs> and uh, I was walking out of the bar and he stopped me and he said, uh, man, I gotta tell you something. There's this purple, I was like demon looking thing hovering behind me when I play guitar and his eyes like, he's like, you know about this, you know? And I'm like, apparently, you know, I, I keep hearing about this um, from people, uh, but I still, you know, I'm kind of taking it with a grain of salt. I'm, you know, it's it's healthy not to read too much into stuff like that. You know what I mean? So um, I did not connect it with this vision that I had had 10 years earlier. Um, in 2011, I was called with a group of friends to a hotel in Farmington, New Mexico to meet with a uh, Lakota Sundance chief. Uh, named Golden Light Eagle. And a Sundance, for those of you that are unfamiliar with this tradition, is where uh, basically higher transcendental states of consciousness are reached by putting hooks, large hooks, through the chests of the men. And they basically dance around a pole in the sun with no water, no food, and no rest for about 72 hours. Uh, it's extremely dangerous and probably extremely effective for walking between worlds. And... Um, Golden Light Eagle is basically a facilitator uh, for for those ceremonies. And um, he and uh, a number of other sort of, I guess, spiritual leaders would be a reasonable 
term for them, like a Hawaiian medicine man, um, and just a whole bunch of, of people from various tribes had met uh, to tell certain selected people about the star tribes and the fact that the Native Americans and different ancient peoples from all around the world had had this relationship with these interdimensional beings for you know thousands and thousands of years and uh they were basically telling us you know like what their message is and what was about to happen over the course of the next 10 years or so and at this uh this event the hawaiian medicine man for example actually said you know may the wind blow to confirm the powers of our prayers and the wind blew so hard that gravel blew across the uh, parking lot so you know when that happened they really had my attention because i'm thinking you know, can you be like full of shit and command the wind? I, I, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I guess it's not out of the question, but they certainly had my attention at that point. Um, lots of other stuff went down with this, this group. So around this time, uh, I would be driving around and I would just suddenly have in my mind's eye, um, this, you know, I don't necessarily mean with my eyes closed. I don't know if this is normal. Uh, like if this happens to everyone, but I can sort of see, translucent images almost like they're being projected they're not physically there but they're not necessarily exactly in my head either I don't know how to explain it but you know I'm driving along and I have this mental image of this like purple and white geisha alien with these big horns that would just suddenly be there and I you know every time I thought man what the hell is that it was very beautiful and interesting um, you know I use the word demon to describe it but that's only because it's a you know, it looks human and it has horns, but there was no connotation of darkness or evil about this being at all. And so this happened a number of times. And when people first started mentioning this being floating behind me, I did not consciously connect it with this vision that I had had around the time of the meeting with these uh, Native Americans and the information about the star tribes and the vision that I had no connection in that moment. However, <laughs> um, a few weeks after um, the last incident, so my girlfriend and my musician friend and the Maori kid, that was all in the space of like maybe a month, those encounters. And so a few weeks after that, I found myself in Ecuador drinking ayahuasca. And maybe the fourth or fifth ceremony in, I'm walking along and I suddenly see that geisha demon alien thing. And Pachamama, the narrator spirit uh, with the ayahuasca experience, um, says, remember that? And I said, yes. And she said, would you like to know what it is? And I said, yes. <laughs> and so she said, well, that's you. Um, so you know how in, in the laboratory, physicists say that they can actually, they can make one object show up in two places. And it's not two objects in different places. It's literally one object in two places. And she said, souls can do that. And so this uh, being here exists as a sort of gaseous invertebrate. So as we evolve, we start out as, you know, uh, material beings in flesh suits in gross matter. Um, and then there's an intermediary stage where um, we're not exactly non-physical, we need some kind of molecules to create a body um, of sorts, a coherence, an energetic coherence, I guess you could say. And so you exist on a gaseous giant, a gas giant in a gaseous form uh, near Sirius A and Sirius B that didn't become a red dwarf star it remained a gas giant because of the gravitational influence of the other two stars and these beings actually transmit what you think of as the hermetic teachings like the Kabbalion um, and you know all that sort of uh, ontological or metaphysical stuff um, to members of the mineral kingdom the plant kingdom humans you know um, so this is like your you know this is you and so, um, it's like, okay, that's completely crazy, but, uh, you know, I'll take it, I guess. And so, uh, and this is, this is important. When I went into the teepee at the end of the night, that shaman's protocol was that they passed a talking stick around and everyone tells everyone else, you know, what their experience was. So I actually told everyone that this had happened and that turned out to be important because two of the people that were present in this ayahuasca ceremony, 
um, were present when I got it in my mind that I should Google it and see if it was known that, uh, you know, the sort of astrophysical details that I received were in fact, you know, confirmed by science. And so, um, I got way more than that even. Uh, so this was about 10 days after the ayahuasca ceremony. Um, I, it just hit me one day. I should Google it and see. So so I did, and five days earlier, which means five days after the ayahuasca ceremony, right? And that's significant because it kind of rules out the possibility that I pulled it out of the collective mind, right? Uh, because it implies that no one on earth knew this stuff at the time that I received it. And so, sure enough, I find this paper that had just been published that says that, you know, the, the uh, existence of a third uh, celestial body... Um, near Sirius A and Sirius B that had been suspected for decades. Uh, they think they had confirmed it and that it was a, a, a gas giant that hadn't become a red dwarf because of the influence of the other two stars. And, you know, I should point out that I don't really know much about astrophysics. And there's, I just can't imagine that I'm capable of just randomly generating the idea that stars could exert an influence on a gas giant that would cause it to to stop developing into a red dwarf star. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know that. So that really hit me like, man, so is this true? And it's also true, you know, that I have had what, you know, you read in the Kabbalion and sort of the uh, non-denominational Gnostic point of view that that real spirituality is an individually centered process that is sort of catalyzed by organic experiences. And, um, you know what I mean? Like I've had all that in my being since I can remember, you know, when I was a little child, um, I, I basically, all of the conversations, all the content that I create on YouTube, I could have made all these videos as a little kid because I've always, it's just this, it didn't develop. It's just always been there. So I kind of felt like, you know, maybe, this is literally true. And if nothing else, I felt like I had at least legitimately received accurate information that wasn't known to mankind about a star system that's however far away um, that, you know, it turned out to be accurate. And I also knew that the Dogon tribe had claimed to have interaction with them with so much evidence that even Carl Sagan said the only possible explanation was that they had been visited by <laughs> ETs, you know. Um, There's a long history of that, and I was well aware of that. So then, uh, a couple hours later, um, and this is the most mind-blowing part of this part, I was not still looking for uh, stuff relating to this ayahuasca experience with Sirius. Uh, I was, I had moved on to other stuff. Probably I was making a video about Alice Bailey or Helena Blavatsky and I was doing research regarding them. And so I pull up this paper that Alice Bailey had written and she said, there are beings on a planet near Sirius B that transmit what we think of as the hermetic teachings to members of the plant, mineral and human kingdom blah 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 exactly almost word for word like word for fucking word what Pachamama had said to me I found in these like 125 year old writings of Alice Bailey randomly a few hours after I found the paper about the uh, influence of Sirius A and Sirius B on you know what I mean so at this point I'm going like man okay this is like super crazy. Uh, and there were witnesses again. My partner actually is right over there and she witnessed all of this. Uh, she was at the ceremony, um, you know, and, and, and as I was finding this stuff, I was emailing her like, look, remember what I said at the end of the ceremony? Look at this shit. And so, um, and so here are some of the other connections that have uncovered since then. Not only does it turn out that there are tribes in the Amazon that claim to be communicating with beings from the same fucking star when they drink ayahuasca, uh, the Masonic lodges do indeed contain uh, the blue star. And according to Alice Bailey, the reason that it's there is that they know that this teaching that we call hermeticism that we associate with Thoth, who some people say was a member of the star tribes, 
um, that that's that's what this all is. And the thing that really, really hit me the hardest in regards to all of those revelations was the fact that the Hopi said that they used secret handshakes to identify other people that had this secret knowledge, right? So we have the Freemasons who use secret handshakes to identify people that have the same secret knowledge, and the Hopi who also incorporate the blue star as a primary spiritual symbol, just like the Freemasons, also identify other people that know the secrets that they know with a secret handshake. So you know what I mean? There are some seriously weird connectivity here and some conceptual continuity that defies rational explanation. And uh, I just, you know, I'm very busy right now, but I felt like it was, as this is all happening, I feel almost obligated to share all of it um, with people because damn. Um, okay, so there's one other element that I want to share. Uh, I do have to get to ceremony, speaking of ayahuasca. Um, but uh, during, um, well, actually much, m many years before I had the encounter with the Native Americans that were uh, telling us about what 1111 really means and also the information about the star tribes. Um, and by the way, right after those people that left, Golden Knight Eagle and his entourage, uh, the next week, um, myself and my girlfriend and every single person that I ran into the next day had encounters with... Um, small translucent uh, ETs that resembled greys uh, in the town of Durango, Colorado. Every single person that I saw the next day with, I didn't say a word. As soon as I approached them, they're like, man, you're not going to believe what happened last night. Five different people, six actually, um, because one of them was two people. It was uh, this pot grower that I knew and his son had seen one in their garden. So everyone that I saw the next day in this town had also seen them. Um, so, uh, <clears throat> also in Durango, Colorado, um, I had this experience where I ate a burrito full of wet mushrooms. It was way too much. Um, and so I found myself transported onto a spaceship, but while I was on the ship, it, it wasn't psychedelic. It was just as normal as like sitting here on this deck right now. You know, it was, it was photorealistic. Uh, and there were these guys in business suits and they said, um, hi and I was like why are you guys dressed like just yuppies or whatever like what is that about and they said we can take any form we want um, but you know it's just not distracting if we just look like this don't worry about it that's not the point and they basically told me that you know you're worried about the Patriot Act this was like 2001 right after 9-11 and all that and they said you know you're worried about the Patriot Act and fascism and all these things um, and, you know, you sort of should be, but you should also know that there are sort of like intergalactic laws. And it's not until a species is on the absolute brink of destroying itself. Um, not a species, but, you know, the, uh, how did they say, like the, um, the apex uh, consciousness. You know what I mean? Like the leading species, the evolutionary uh, um, leader. Uh, so humans, uh, you know, on this planet, where when you're on the verge of destroying the entire thing for everyone and everything on it, right? Um, planetary extinction. Right at the last moment, we can come down and intervene, but not until then. Um, so don't worry about it. And uh, then they said, you're not going to like it uh, when you wake up, so we're going to let you have some fun. And they opened up the back of the spaceship, and I went riding around on this sea of, like, pure music, and then I woke up in a jail cell which at first I thought was the laundry room, like I had wandered down to the laundry room and then I saw the toilet and I realized that laundry rooms don't have toilets and it slowly started to <laughs> dawn on me that I had been arrested for spouting weird poetry, I guess. Um, but, uh, you know, I would point out that, um, well, <laughs> there's actually another element to that story. So 10 years after I had that experience, uh, I went to meet with Golden Light Eagle and those other natives um, who had this talk that they gave about the star tribes uh and there was a girl there and uh we weren't like interested in each other or anything it wasn't like that but somehow we exchanged information and so uh, a few weeks after the meeting she called me randomly and she said hey i had this dream last night that um i was on this spaceship with these aliens that were sort of dressed in business suits 
And they were telling me that, you know, they are not allowed to intervene until the absolute last minute when a species is about to destroy itself and blah, blah, blah. And I had not told her about my experience. And so I listened to this and I just said, so why are you telling me about it? And I just got dead silence on the, on the line. And she said, I have no idea. I just sort of like intuitively just called you and told you because I felt like that was the thing to do. So that was interesting. And then I would also add to all of this that the fact that we are basically witnessing, um, what is it called when they admit um, disclosure? We're, that's happened. That has happened, right? It started a long time ago. The Mexican military said, you know, here are these orbs and they had like, a, like look, looked almost like lightning balls. They were like balls of like flashing, uh, you know, those things you put your hand on and the electricity finds your fingers. They look like that. Only they're chasing the, the Mexican jets around. Uh, that was like one of the first things that was like, you know, significantly insane. And then I think the British prime minister said something about how the U S had made contact and was lying about it. And then, um, this is the craziest one though. Remember how I called them the Star Tribes? Well, they also introduced themselves as the Galactic Federation. And uh, a few years ago, I saw that, um, and this is directly to me. This is not something I saw on the internet. You understand what I'm saying? Like, this is, the, the Galactic Federation was, this was way before it was an internet thing. I didn't even use the internet back then in 2011, really, honestly. And, you know, but it wasn't, it wasn't a thing then. And, um... The, I guess he was an ex-prime minister of Israel actually said that they're called the Galactic Federation, which is how they introduced themselves to me in this vision, right? So then, you know, all of this stuff coming together, and here we are on the brink of complete and utter destruction, and we have, you know, Congress meeting uh, every day for an hour a few months ago, I think it was, uh, and the military is debriefing Congress saying, you know, there are definitely these things all over the planet. They're coming out of the ocean. We don't know what they are. They move in ways that defy physics. Like there, and okay. So here's another element to consider about this. You guys, if there are beings here that are that much more advanced than humans, humans have already totally lost control of whatever's happening on this planet, right? If we're already infested with like ships that can outmaneuver, you know what I mean? Like you guys have probably seen the videos if you're watching this video. We, we're already at their mercy, right? So, and I think, you know, this idea that they're intervening at the last moment when we're about to destroy ourselves completely, with the advent of AI and, uh, you know, the toxicity of the environment and the uh, 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 lack of food and resources, um, without alien intervention, we're pretty much screwed in a sort of new world order or Orwellian population reduction kind of scenario. There's no other option. People think it's evil, but I honestly think it's just the world leaders kind of going, well, it's either everyone or some people. What do you do if those are your options, your only options? So I just, you know, having had the, and you guys can check, I've been talking about this stuff for years in case you suspect that I made it all up for this live stream or something. You can go back on my YouTube channel, like four or five years. And I told all these stories a long time ago. Um, so you know, and it just really seems to me like the fact that I was told that all those years ago, and here we are on the brink of World War III and all of these other factors, and the U.S. government even is like, yes, we are crawling with ETs on this planet. It is all coming together exactly like I was told that it would, the way the Hopi have been expecting it to. You know, I mean, it's just really, truly a remarkable thing. And, uh, I, you know, put on your seatbelts, kids. <laughs> So, um, I'm trying to catch up with the, um, I lived in Durango for a month. Yeah. Durango is an amazing place, man. I had, um, yeah, I am. Well, I am. I staying in South America indefinitely at the moment indefinitely, uh, sort of. Yeah. I mean, we just basically got invited to take over this property where, uh, the Quechua have been going to drink ayahuasca for thousands of years. The shaman that owns the property is very sick and, um, through a series of astonishing coincidences. I mean, this story is just as crazy as everything else I've been saying in this live stream. Um, and I'm waiting to tell the story until myself and the shaman are sitting together telling it so that it's, you know, that's just the best way to deliver it. Um, but they've invited us to come and do ceremony there because he's very sick and they can no longer like maintain the property. 
Um, so there's like this big flat stone with a perfectly spherical stone that is sitting on top and you can see the stone, you can't tell if it's natural or not, it has this ring to hold the sphere and when you drink ayahuasca you can feel it vibrating. There's uh, caverns on the property like five minutes from the dorms, like you just walk right into the caverns. Uh, there's like crystal clear river with, you know, we're allowed to gold pan and there is gold. Um, waterfalls, there are parrots around the house. There's, you know, cacao and coca plants and banana and guanabana and all. There's a fish farm there. So if you come to visit and World War III breaks out, we have over a thousand breeding tilapia in pools. Nobody needs to worry about it. If you can't get home, we're fine. Um, it's in the middle of nowhere. There are monkeys on the property, probably jaguar. Somebody got a video of a jaguar right down the river here a little while back. And this place is a little bit deeper in the jungle. So it's as real as it gets. Um, and then we're going to have like a plant medicine school. So the local uh, Quechua, it, it just by luck, I guess, the Quechua. Um, and by the way, ayahuasca is a Quechua um, name. Uh, you know, people associate ayahuasca more with the Shipibo because they're a larger tribe. And I think they sort of got the commercial attention and I'm not downplaying their, you know, they are number one in terms of knowledge of the plants of the jungle and stuff. That's all true. Um, but the Quechua are really the progenitors and the discoverers probably originally of ayahuasca. And so this property is likely where it all began. Um, and there's a spring that only women and couples are allowed to go to. We're going to have special ceremonies with cacao and the flowers of the Sananga eyedrop plant uh, are a strong aphrodisiac. So we'll combine the cacao with the flowers of Ushu Sananga um, along with a couple other uh, components. We're going to have like uh, couples retreats. Um, so definitely send me an email if all that sounds interesting to you. It's going to be absolutely amazing. I just cannot even believe, you know, we had no money. Um, and I basically, I'll tell you the short version is that uh, we decided we didn't like the woman that owns the property where we are now because she was basically trying to exploit the local people and insisting that we did too because she said that if we paid them more, they would expect it from her and she didn't want us to ruin her exploitation economy. So we went out and drank ayahuasca and I asked the universe, please like just show me a way out that's obvious. And I, the next day I was in the nearest city and I talked to one guy, one guy. I went into the store to buy Agua de Florida for the ceremony that night and he just starts talking to me and he's like, I have this property and I need somebody and oh, it's because I mentioned that I had been studying the, the, the medicine since I was a child and, and he said, yeah, you got to come out and see this and so we went out to look at it and at first he wanted us to buy it and it was a million and a half dollars. Don't have that kind of money, have no money actually. and. Um, so uh, they just said, okay, well, how about if you just don't have to pay us anything and we'll just take a commission. So that's another thing about these retreats. 50% of all of the money that is paid goes directly to this ailing shaman and the Quechua community that owns the property. 50%. So um, it just couldn't be better for everyone involved. It's an amazing uh, situation. And, and it is going to be more expensive than our last round of retreats um, because the overhead's way higher. But man, it is incredible it's impossible there's even a uh, like 19,000 foot mountain so you can hike in the jungle or you can go as high as you want up in the Andes right on the property um, and, you know to get handed oh and there was a flag of Baphomet in the ayahuasca building of course Baphomet is extremely significant to me but I, I just walked in that building going how is this I mean he has his hands in the as above so below uh, positions the whole nine yards and I, I just saw it and I'm like man what the, why is this here turns out the Quechua have a spirit called Supai that is exactly the same as uh, Baphomet and is pictured with his hands in the as above so below um, positions the whole thing so you know honestly the moment I saw that flag of this Baphomet exactly the same as Baphomet and it represents exactly the same stuff I knew that we were destined to be there. There's just no way that. Um, so yeah, two weeks from today, uh, putting a promo video together as soon as we get back from the volcano in Banos. Um, so you guys will get to see the, the vibrating stone and the caverns and the shaman um, and all that. So thank you guys so much for spending this time with me. I have to go start a fire and prepare for tonight's ceremony. Hit the like button, share, subscribe. Please support us on Patreon, PayPal, Zelle, whatever. We really appreciate it. Uh, PayPal gives us nothing, or um, excuse me, 
YouTube gives us nothing because we're demonetized and actually has notified me that they bury my content in people's feeds across all social media platforms. Um, so I really need you guys uh, to help me um, to grow. Otherwise, I, I'll have to stop doing this because I can't put you know 100 hours a month into it um, and not get any compensation at all. So I appreciate you guys so much and hopefully we'll see you all at the retreats in December.